and thank you for turning it, tuning into WSB, William Shakespeare Broadcasting. I'm your host, Jack Kilgore. And I'm Seth Harris, and tonight we're going to be talking about the great drama Julius Caesar. But before we talk about that, I think we should uh, talk about the man who created Julius Caesar, William Shakespeare. What do you think, Seth? William Shakespeare was an English playwright in the 1500s. He is known as one of the greatest writers in the English language. He's written dramas, poems, and many other works. His dramas have been adapted into every language ever created. His dramas are known for their use of dramatic irony and tragedy. Julius Caesar has both of these elements, and it is without question one of Shakespeare's finest works. Let's begin by talking about the characters a little bit, Seth. Good idea. We'll start with Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is a Roman general. The Roman people are very fond of him and want to make him king of Rome. This event would end the Republic of Rome, which has a senate, not a king. Although Caesar publicly declines becoming king, he thinks of himself as a higher status than everyone else, even his close associates. And then there's Brutus. Brutus is a well-regarded nobleman who does everything in the best interest of Rome. He is on, his honorable actions make it very easy for other people to manipulate him into doing things that he thinks are good for Rome. Cassius is a talented general and longtime friend of Caesar. Cassius hates the fact that Caesar is becoming treated like a god. He's very effective in whatever he does, but lacks integrity. Then there's Antony. Antony is a loyal friend of Caesar's. He is a very spontaneous person who is very impulsive and passionate. He is very resourceful and can, com can com come up with an idea in any situation. Octavius is Caesar's adopted son and his heir. He is very much like his father, rising up as an authoritative figure to everyone. Then there's Calpurnia, is Caesar's wife, and Portia is Brutus's wife. They both worry tremendously about their husband's actions throughout the story. Act 1 begins with two tribunes walking around Rome. The people are neglecting their work in order to see Julius Caesar in his parade of triumph. The tribunes scold the citizens and remove the decorations from the statues of Caesar. Caesar and his men enter and a fortune teller tells him to beware the Ides of March. Caesar ignores him and proceeds to his celebration. Cassius and Brutus then converse about Caesar. Brutus fears that if Caesar becomes king, the Republic would be overturned. Cassius hates how one man is treated like a god. Cassius thinks Caesar's rise to power is because of his and Brutus's lack of will to stop him. Caesar, tell Caesar later tells Antony that he deeply distrusts Cassius. Casca, another tribune, tells Cassius that Antony offered the crown to Caesar, but Caesar declined it three times. Cassius has letters forged to look like Romans want Caesar dead. He has Cinna the poet put the letters in Brutus's home so that Brutus will read them and join the conspiracy. In Act 2, Brutus reads the forged letters. He believes it is for the good of Rome to remove Caesar from power. Cassius and the conspirators show up at Brutus's home, and Brutus takes over as head of the conspiracy. Cassius explains that he wants to kill Antony as well as Caesar, because he is too dangerous to be kept alive. Brutus, however, says if Antony dies, it will look too bloody and the motive will be gone. They agree to spare Antony, and the conspirators leave. Portia asks Brutus why he is acting so troublesome and worried. She asks Brutus to confide in her, but Brutus tells her that it is nothing. The next day, Caesar is preparing to go to the Senate. Calpurnia pleads for Caesar to stay home because she ha had a nightmare about his death. Caesar agrees until a conspirator convinces him to come to the Senate. He agrees and they depart. And now to the head of our literary search and rescue team, Dustin Sidney, with a shocking discovery. Thanks, mates. We're at Brutus's old home, a historic event indeed. We have just found an old forged letter from Brutus that is approximately a millennium and ten decades old. Let's take a listen. I think it's safe to pick him up. What is this? Did you write this yourself? With crayons? Anyway, the penmanship is so terrible, we can only make out about three lines. Here it is. Brutus, you're sleeping. Wake up. Look at yourself. Is Ram going to... Dot? We can't make that out. Terrible. Will Ram submit to one man's power? That, my friends, is for you to decide. Thank you, Dustin. And now here is our brand new segment, Cooking with Chris. Take it away, Chris. Cooking with Chris on WSB. Yeah.
Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. Just washing my hands. First thing you should do in the kitchen. Welcome to Cooking with Chris, with your host, Chris Levy. How y'all doing today? Uh, my plan for the show today is we're going to make some sugar, sugar cookies with all of our ingredients here. Cooking with Chris on WSB. Yeah! Welcome back to Cooking with Chris. Like I said before, we're making Caesar sugar cookies. First ingredient today, we're going to do a sprinkle of envy. It's a lot of envy. Second off, a drop of greed. One of my favorite ingredients. And then a hint of ambition. Delicious. Last ingredient of the day, a crack of jealousy. So that's my first day. All right. I'm going to take it over the counter. We'll get back to you after Cooking this. with Chris on WSB. Yeah. Howdy. Welcome back to our show. Just doing a little bit of stirring to get it started. From here, I'm going to take it into the oven for a little bit. Now, I'm going to preheat to about 450. It's whatever you want, though. And I'll get back to you a little later in the show. See how they turned out. Signing off. Cooking with Chris on WSB. Yeah. Hey, I just pulled these bad boys out of the oven. Let's see how they taste. The conspiracy against Caesar. Hey, who are you? You don't work here. Hey, hey, who, hey, 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 just get out of here. Hey, who, hey, hey, hold on a minute. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Cooking with Chris on WSB. Yeah. Sorry about that. We're getting word that that wasn't the real Chris, and the real Chris had been murdered previously. But back to the show. In Act 3, when Caesar is on his way to the Senate, the fortune teller again warns him, but he dismisses it once again. At the Senate, the conspirators all kneel around Caesar and then stab him to death. Caesar fights the death until he realizes Brutus is one of the conspirators. He then dies without a fight. The conspirators wash their hands in Caesar's blood, and then Antony returns. He pledges allegiance to Brutus and the conspirators. He asks to speak after Brutus at Caesar's funeral. When the conspirators leave, Antony swears that Caesar's death will be avenged. Brutus speaks to the Roman citizens and explains that Caesar's ambition was too much for the city of Rome. The people believe him and are content. However, Antony's speech is extremely sarcastic and it stirs the people up against the conspirators. He then reads the will of Caesar, which gives money to every citizen of Rome, which enrages the people into a fury against Brutus and Cassius. They drive the conspirators from the city and kill Cinna the poet. Once again, here's Dustin Sidney, our reporter in the field. Good life. Okay. Welcome back, mates. We're here at Caesar's burial site. And uh, after hours of digging, we still have not found the body. Caesar's very hard to find. Dustin, what's that? That's him. That's Caesar. Let's go. Excuse me, sir. A question? Hello? He's not interested today. We'll come back later. We'll get you. Thanks, Dustin. It's a shame you didn't get that question. I pray you get out of there alive. And Act 4 begins with Antony and Octavius speaking about which conspirators should be killed. They agree that all of, the, all of them should be put to death and prepare to go to war. Meanwhile, Brutus and Cassius argue, argue about morals and honor, but they eventually reconciled. Brutus rece reveals that he is in grief because in his absence, Portia killed herself by swallowing hot coals. That night, Brutus is awoken by the ghost of Caesar, who declares that they will meet again on the battlefield. Brutus has their armies move forward immediately, knowing the two armies will meet very soon. And now to another one of our segments, The Conspiracy Corner, with Devin O'Neill. Devin? Hello, and welcome to The Conspiracy Corner. I'm Devin, and our special guest today is the Thank wonderful you. Glad to be here. Anthony. Glad to be here. Anthony, uh, you look like you had a rough night last night, to well, be honest. Tell me about to it. To be honest, yes. I was out with the boys, Octavius and Lepidus. Oh, okay. Just hanging out, partying a little bit, it's whatever. So I understand your friend Caesar died. How do you feel about this? Yeah, that 
very unfortunate. His mm -hmm. good friends were what we thought were Brutus and Cassius and a bunch of other conspirators. Brutus. Stabbed him in the back. So I understand you and Octavius are going to war with Brutus and his playmates. Yes, we are. We are. We've gotten a little army together over mm -hmm. the years. A little pulling a little bit from everybody. Mm -hmm. Whatever we can get our hands on. It's a pretty tough little army, though. I think we have a shot in this one. So uh, what, do you, what do you do to juice up to get excited for a, for a big game like this? Uh, some guys like to hunt hogs, others have a drink, some dance a little bit. Whatever you're feeling gets you in the mood for war. Always gets me in the mood for war. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. We're going to go back to the studio. See you later. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me Thank again, you. Devin. I'll see you. Thanks, Devin. In Act 5, the two armies meet. The four generals meet on the battlefield and insult each other prior to the battle. During the battle, Cassius hears that Brutus's men aren't doing very well. He sends one of his men, Pindarus, to see what's happening. Pindarus sees Titinius, Cassius's best friend, being surrounded by cheering troops. Assuming that he had been captured, Pindarus returns to Cassius. Cassius is so sad that he orders Pindarus to kill him. Cassius proclaims that Caesar has been avenged as he dies. Soon after, Titinius arrives. In fact, those cheering men were his soldiers, and they were celebrating a victory. Filled with grief, Titinius kills himself. Brutus hears about both deaths and prepares for battle again. When his army loses, he has one of his men hold a sword. He then runs into it and declares that Caesar may now rest, satisfied. Antony and Octavius then arrive, and Antony speaks of Brutus as the noblest Roman of all. He explains that while the other conspirators acted out of greed and envy, Brutus had, a, Brutus had the best interest of Rome in mind. They ordered that Brutus have an honorable burial. They then depart to Rome to celebrate their victory. Thank you for tuning in tonight to WSB. I'm Jack Kilgore. And I'm Seth Harris. And you stay classy, Miss Seaweed. Take it away, boys. Come on, come on. Come on.